Good morning to everybody and welcome as we continue our journey through the book of Genesis. And we've come up to Abraham's greatest test towards the end of his life. And we will be reading from Genesis 20 to Genesis 22. So if you have your Bibles, pull them out and we'll journey together as we're starting to wrap up the life of the first patriarch, the father of the faithful. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings, your blessings of studying your word. Lord, I just thank you that you have uh, blessed us so far. And may you continue to guide us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we left off Abraham right after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we would think that by this time, Abraham had learned from his, his mistakes. He'd seen his past sins, and he'd repented of them, and he wouldn't do them again. But as we read Genesis chapter 20, we see that that wasn't exactly the case, which can give us hope. If any of you have had a lapse into a sin that you have previously struggled with earlier in your life. And in Genesis chapter 20, we see that Abraham commits the same sin he committed in chapter 12. That is, he constructs this story that Sarah is his sister because he's afraid of Abimelech, this king, and that he's going to uh, take her as his wife and, and do harm to Abraham. And we see it's the exact same story that, that unfolds. God protects him, tells Abimelech, don't touch this lady because this man is a prophet. This is the first time Abraham is called a prophet. First time anybody in the Bible is called a prophet in, in Genesis chapter 20. And again, we see God's deliverance, God's grace, God's mercy. Remember, he had told Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. But we see that Abraham wasn't blameless. And yet, God still blessed him, still was working with him, and delivers him from the situation in Genesis chapter 20. So we move to Genesis chapter 21. And we won't spend much time here because when we d discuss the people of the East, we discuss much of this chapter. But we see that finally, finally, Abraham is 100, Sarah is 90, and finally they have a son, the son of promise, the son that they've waited for for so long. Everything is good, right? Sarah says, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. So Isaac means laughter. That means there was joy in the house. But what happened? Ishmael and Hagar were threatening this happiness. There was jealousy between the two parties, and Sarah wasn't about to share the affections of a second wife and this former first son with her son that she now has. And so she tells Abraham to get rid of them. And you remember this was a very difficult ordeal for Abraham. And he casts her away, and they go out in the desert, they wander around, they're about to die, and yet God is merciful to them. And he saves them, makes Ishmael into a great nation, which we looked at in our previous uh, sermon when we discussed the children of the East. So what happens right after that? Abraham cuts, as they say in the Hebrew, a covenant with a local king, uh, Abimelech, that was as per his policy. And this is the first time the Philistines are mentioned in the Bible. So they're introduced in Genesis chapter 21, and we will see them recurring throughout the history of Abraham's descendants and when they come back into the land that was promised by God to Abraham. And it is with that background that we now enter Genesis chapter 22. Isaac is now 20 years old. He's a young man. That would mean Abraham is 20 and Sarah is 110. And this is the eighth occasion that God comes and talks to Abraham. And this is where we will pick up the story. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. The first verse tells us what? God came to test Abraham. Now, why would he test Abraham? Abraham had already lived a life. Abraham had failed some tests and he passed some tests. He'd been faithful. He'd been hospitable. He'd talked with God. He was his, his agent in, in delivering Lot. Uh, he was interceding for the other nations, which God wanted him to do. 
And yet we, we see that he had moral failings as well. He'd concocted this plan with Sarah's help to have Hagar. Twice he'd lied about who Sarah was and had gotten into pretty bad situations with local kings. And so we see that at an age when Abraham was longing just to have peace and quiet, he had done very well. God had blessed him. He was wealthy. He was respected, as we see in these chapters. The local kings came to him and wanted to make covenants with him, and they, they knew that God was with him. And yet God, at this old age, when finally they had the son they'd been waiting for, and everything seemed just right, it seemed like he was going to coast off into the sunset, and what a beautiful story this would have been, that Abraham had been God's friend on earth, and he waited and waited, and he'd had some failings, and yet God was merciful to him, and then finally God gave him the son of promise, and now he could go to his grave peacefully. Even in those days, Abraham was considered an old man at this age. And yet we see that God's severest test came to Abraham in his oldest years. Now why does God test? Exodus 16.4 says the Lord tested the Israelites later on the descendants of Abraham with manna. They were only to gather enough for that day except on Fridays they gathered twice as much for a Sabbath. This was a test. That is God was seeing would they be faithful to him? Would they trust him enough? Now why, do you, why does God test us? I mean God shouldn't test us, right? I mean, we don't want him to be this, this strict, severe teacher. And in this case, it appears that this was a very severe test. But let's look at Deuteronomy 8, 2, and 16, and I'll put it up on the screen. God tested the Israelites to see if they would obey him, to humble and test you so that in the end, it might go well with you. Why does God test us? Why did God test the patriarchs? He tested them. Because he wanted it to go well with them. Why does God test us? Because he wants us to see that only by obedience to him, it will go well with us. Even when it doesn't appear logical. Because here is a test. Now this is quite a test. God was asking Abraham to make a human sacrifice. And you'll notice this was a burnt offering. This was for sin. This was to, to cover the sins of the, the community. And he says, take your son, your only son Isaac. So he even throws him in there. And then he throws in the one you love. <laughs> I mean, is this a cruel joke on God's part? Asking Abraham to, to make this human sacrifice of the son of promise that he's waited his whole life for. And with ups and downs and joys and sorrows and anxiety. And now God is asking him to give it all up. To give up Isaac. And to make this human sacrifice sacrifice. What, would, what do you think Satan was telling Abraham during this ordeal? What do you think his temptations were? What were his doubts? You could probably add some to this list, but I'm sure the temptations were, you must be deluded, old man. You're 120. Are you really hearing the voice of God this time? This is against God's law. You, the God's law says, thou shalt not kill. And you are going to go kill your own son, something that you know that God detests, and he's asking you to do it. How will your witness be? You won't be a good witness for God with this test. You'll ruin your witness. You must have misunderstood God. Maybe you're hearing other voices. Maybe you have psychological problems. Satan would have been right there every step of the way, trying to get Abraham not to exemplify, not to put forth effort to obey the voice of God. So we read on. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. And he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Now the book Patriarchs and Prophets adds a little bit of detail to this story. And we see that, yeah, Abraham got up early in the morning. Why? Because he wasn't sleeping. He couldn't understand why this was going on. Why this inner turmoil? Why this torture of soul over this command of God? God. 
and he wakes up early and he looks at Sarah. Doesn't wake her up. Notice Sarah's not in the story. I'm sure Abraham would have thought she might derail God's whole plan here because this was her only son. Looks at Isaac, still sleeping peacefully, young man in the prime of life. Wakes him up, tells him we need to go worship God on, at an altar. Now this probably was commonplace for them. Abraham had set altars all around that part of the land and Isaac had probably accompanied him to these different altars to worship Yahweh. But they journey three days. And if we were two of those men servants that were called to go on that trip, what an awkward trip it was. Abraham pondering in his mind, how is he going to tell Isaac? Why is this happening? Why does he have to do this? He's waited all this time to get Isaac, and now God's asking him to give him up. And they journey on in silence. And again, Abraham, Abraham spends nights in prayer, agonizing with God, please, do I have to do this? Now, you're starting to see shades of other stories that come into the Gospels about the Messiah. And we see here that Abraham is sojourning for three days and almost despairing, probably. And they get there and he doesn't want anybody to see and he tells the men, men servants to stay there while he and the boy go on. And they take the wood, the fire, <clears throat> And they don't have a lamb. And Isaac's no dummy. And he realizes this. And this is what the Bible later says. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it. <clears throat> um, he, he placed it in, uh, I'm sorry, he placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Ab to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. So what did Abraham think? All he could answer Isaac was, God will provide. Hebrews 11:19 says this, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. That is to say, Abraham knew that God had promised through Isaac his offspring would be reckoned, and now he's asking him to kill him. This must be some plan where God is going to raise the dead. And he believed that God was an almighty God, that God had power over death. Now, when we look at most of our doubts and our fears, most of them are probably related somehow to death. The Bible says later in Romans that we've been delivered from this fear of death. And here Abraham is having to face it head on and he believes that his God is more powerful than death. And therefore he obeys. Because, hey, what's the worst that can happen to us? We'll die. <laughs> right? And I know it's, it sounds pithy and... Like, yeah, it's just such common sense, but it's not to our human souls. And we see that Abraham wrestled with God over this, as later we will see his grandson wrestle with the angel. And he wrestled with God, understanding that God is above and beyond our understanding, and he's more powerful than we can think or imagine, even powerful enough to raise the dead, according to Hebrews. This is how Noah was thinking. And they journeyed on to the place that God had told them about, verse 9. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Now what mountain was this? It was in the hills of Moriah. This is the present day site of Jerusalem. That is, this is not very far from a hill called Golgotha, which later when we read in the story, the Son of God died on. So we see the rich analogies between the crucifixion of Jesus and this story. And that God was letting the Jewish nation and the rest of the world, this was their story, to tell that Abraham, their father, was asked to give up his son on this hill on Mount Moriah. Now, what does it say? It says that 
he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now there's a lot in that little part of that verse 9. Let's just think of Isaac for a minute. You notice your dad is just not saying anything. He seems incredibly discouraged. This is probably unusual for him. You leave the men servants down. Do you want to be alone? This is kind of strange behavior. You're, you don't have a lamb. And you get to the top of the mountain and your dad tells you, you know what, son, you are the son of promise, the one I've waited for for so long. And now God has asked me to kill you, to sacrifice you. Abraham was exhausted. A three-day journey at the age of 120, going through all this emotional, spiritual turmoil. Isaac could have easily overpowered him and ran away and said, Dad, I think you've lost it. You've been a godly man, but I just can't believe that, the, that God would ask you to do this. And with terror and amazement, he hears these words and he, he's trying to process them. And we see from the story, from what is not said, that he voluntarily goes along with this. And if you read in Patriarchs and Prophets, he actually helps his dad's hands bind him, bind him to the altar. The faith he had in a God to lay down his life in hopes that God would resurrect him. So we see Isaac as a willing sacrifice, that he goes along with his dad. He doesn't put up a fight. He voluntarily gives himself up because he could have gotten out of the situation. And we see that Abraham now is going to have to do the impossible. And in verse 10, it says, Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And as he's lifting that knife, just about to do the unthinkable, the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Whew. I'm sure Isaac takes this huge deep breath. Abraham probably just drops the knife and takes a huge sigh of relief. God has answered and he says, do not kill your son. Because in reality, God hated this practice. God was asking him to do this. And the Bible is clear, this was a test. This was not something you and I should go out and say, well, boy, this would really show our love for God. I'm gonna go sacrifice up my kid this afternoon. Don't do it. It's absolutely abominable in God's eyes to kill your own children. And God here is showing the plan of salvation, of what it was going to take to overcome. You see, this was a greater test than Adam and Eve had had. Adam and Eve didn't have to suffer. There was just one tree in the middle of the garden. Hey, just don't go eat it. But Abraham had to suffer in his test. It was three days of just inner turmoil and anxiety and wondering and questioning and struggling with God to believe that his promise was true. And we see there, verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. You see, God somehow had to let Abraham and his descendants understand the cost of human salvation. Because you, if you remember, this is not just a battle going on on this planet. This is a battle for the whole universe. Yeah, is God unfair? This was Satan's charge. Is God a caring God? I mean, he's got this strict law and we have to abide by it. And look, Adam and Eve can't, can't uh, obey it. And then he, he's going to kill them because of it. And see, they've died. I mean, is this plan of salvation really all that it's cracked up to be? I mean, come on. God's not fair. And the angels are watching. The other planets are watching. 
Abraham thought he'd left everybody and that nobody was going to know about this because he didn't want anybody to know he'd killed his own son. He didn't want anybody to see it, at least. They would have found out later. And yet we see here God asked him to do this so that when that knife dropped out of Abraham's hand and he could unbind Isaac and give him a huge bear hug, that everyone would know that an innocent ram, an innocent lamb, would have to come from heaven and give up his life as a ransom, as a perfect offering before God. Oh, the depths and wonder of God's love. Now Abraham could say, now I see. You have provided. You are a great God who loves enough that you'll give your own son. Which, by the way, I'm just going to take a minute here. Usually when we talk about the crucifixion, we talk about Jesus' agony. But let's face it, when Jesus died, he gave up the spirit, it says, and he didn't know anything. It was God the Father that suffered for three days. He lost his only son, the one whom he loved, just as we saw in this chapter. Now, what was he called up in heaven? We have no idea. Son, father, without a mother. It's, it's irrelevant to the story. He was Yahweh, the God who exists, the God, the Yahweh provider, the one who sees his creation in desperate need, in need of salvation. And he gives everything. He gives the best he could give and gives it up voluntarily, going through the agony of soul. Folks, brothers and sisters, God the Father suffered when Jesus was on the cross. We can't make it seem like he's just this robot of a God, stern and strict and severe with his creatures. We see in Abraham's life that that turmoil that was going through him as a human father was the same heart of love that suffered and struggled as he gave up his own son. Sometimes we don't think of God with these emotions, and yet the story tells us, shows us, that we are created in the image of God, and to give up something like this comes at a, a cost, a cost of your, of your being. And Abraham was asked to give up the most precious thing to him so that we would understand that God the Father is giving up everything he can for our salvation. Paul later says, if God gave up his own son, will he not grant us all things? If you're questioning the heart of God today, if you wonder what God has plans for your life and what he wants to do in your life, look to Mount Moriah. Look to the story of Abraham. Look later in the New Testament to the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And you see that the father had to struggle and wanting to grab his son out of that garden of Gethsemane. And yet Jesus cried, not my will, but yours be done. See, God had to give it up. Had to give up Jesus. It came at a huge cost. And Jesus had to have that same attitude that Isaac and Abraham have as our brother in understanding and hoping but not being able to see it, just as we can't see beyond the grave, but hoping and hope from God's word that our God is almighty and that he has a power over death. We finish the chapter, Genesis 22, 15 through 17. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. See, what does God want us to do? Does he, like I mentioned before, does he want us to go out and sacrifice our children? No, he's only asking for obedience. Later in, in the Gospels, John records what Jesus said. He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Because he realized that they, they were Abraham's literal descendants, but they weren't his spiritual descendants. They weren't doing the same works Abraham was doing. Now, what did Abraham do? Genesis 26, 5 later says, Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, and my decrees, and my laws. 
That is, Abraham aimed to have a blameless life. He aimed, and we see that he didn't always do it exactly perfect, but that his, his goal in life was to obey the voice of God whenever he heard it. James 2, 21 through 24 says this, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous, or what he did when he offered, for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. So are we saved by our works? Absolutely not. Was Abraham saved by his works? Absolutely not. He was, he was an imperfect sacrifice. Isaac was an imperfect sacrifice. It wouldn't, re wouldn't have redeemed his life or the life of his father. There was no way that they could redeem themselves. And yet, when they came to the one who did, God just asked them to follow him. Just asked them to obey him. And his faith, it says his faith that he was going to be redeemed from death, was completed, made perfect, by his actions in his belief. You see the relationship between faith and works. As James later says, you know, faith without or any works, without any obedience, is dead. You really don't have faith. He was called God's friend. Is obeying the law too much to ask of us? When contemplating this story, and when we contemplate the ultimate sacrifice, is it too much of God to ask just to obey his voice? You see, God doesn't ask anything except that we give up our sinful hearts, that we give up our ideas, as later on he says in Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm sure Abraham was wrestling that God was being unfair but he, he, he went over, back over his life. He'd seen that God had not been unfair to him. And he said, I, this is the voice of God. I will obey here as well. And so he obeyed God. So should we look at Calvary. And when we think of what God has done for us. All we can say is, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Remember Genesis chapter 17, this new heart that God wants to give? It's right after that that Genesis 22 comes in and shows how we get that new heart. We get it by faith in a God who is willing to give us all things because he gave up his own son. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this story. And Lord, we falter, we fail, as Abraham did. But Lord, you've said that a righteous man gets up he may fall seven times, but he gets up seven times. May we continue to look to you. May we not look to the past, but may we look for your voice, listen for your voice, look for your leading in our lives. May you bless us, may you protect us until we meet again. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.